To promote my new flower shop, I had one place print my business cards, another print my brochures, and a third, my signs. Now my roses aren't red, my violets aren't blue, my geraniums look dead, and I don't know what to do. Staples can help your business stand out with signs, banners, and brochures that are a true reflection of your company. And now at Staples, spend $50 or more on print and marketing services and get $5 off your next in-store purchase. Now my business is blossoming and I'm spending less green. Exclusions apply. In-store only. And 623.18. Defending Capitalism by Yaron Brook. Good morning, everybody. Hope you're all having a, a good time. This week, or the week that you're spending here, We've created kind of a, an enclave, a, a place of, uh, which is very different than the world that exists out there. A place where you can assume a certain level of uh, rationality, a certain agreement with your values, uh, respite from the kind of world we live on a day-to-day basis uh, out there. And it, it's, a, it's a world that's getting, in many respects, It's getting worse almost every day. Um, But it's really nothing new. I mean, I need to, I think I need to remind you that Ayn Rand was talking about the disastrous culture and the trends in the culture 50 years ago. Atlas Shrugged was not written in a period of some, uh, in some wonderful world, uh, and she was projecting some dark future. It was written when things were pretty bad and she could see the cultural trends and where they were heading to and they, where they were going. You know, Obama is particularly bad, but let's not forget that just nine, ten years ago, after 9-11, uh, many of us were horrified by the attitude of the Bush administration and by the response of the Bush administration to what happened in 9-11 and the pathetic nature of, of the war that was fought or not fought since then. And yes, Obama's just made it worse, but he's made something really bad worse. And let's not forget all those years in the Bush administration of increasing spending and growth of the welfare state and new programs and, you know, just more and more of this, of the policies that ultimately led to the financial crisis we're in and led to the election of Obama. So this is a long-term trend. Obama is a particularly nasty now, culmination, or maybe it's hof- hopefully culmination of the trend, but, uh, and, it, and it gets better from now on, but a particularly nasty point on that trend and an accelerator of the trend towards statism. Yeah. And Obama's particularly, I think, ideological and his motivation is particularly evil in its, you know, it's an egalitarianism and in, in his willing, in his uh, seeking out uh, equal outcomes out there. But the battle is a long-term battle. The battle started a long time ago with Ayn Rand and will continue for quite a while. But things today are particularly bad. They're particularly bad and they're coming to a head. So I want to urge you that there, in a sense, there's one big battle and it's a long-term battle and it's a philosophical battle and it's a battle to establish objectivism as the secular philosophy, the dominant secular philosophy in America. And that is the goal. That is the battle. That's what we're, that's what we're striving towards. And it's a philosophical, ideological battle. But as part of that battle, there is a short-term battle that needs to happen as well. And that is a battle to make the long-term possible. To make sure that there is a long-term so that we can win that long-term battle. And that is a battle, I think, I'll call it the battle for capitalism. And I'd urge you all to join that battle for capitalism. What I want to talk about today is what I think we can do as individuals when we're advocating for capitalism, what are the things that we need to point out to the world out there? What are the things that we need, what are the points that we need to make in the culture out there in this battle to keep things from getting a lot worse? To save the United States so that we can really save it in that long-term educational philosophical battle that parts of which I described the other night in the, in the, uh, the talk about AI. 
Okay, so I want to talk about, I'm going to talk about a few points. What I think, points that I think we need to convey out there. And the first is what is capitalism? We need to be clear on that. Yeah. We need to be clear on does capitalism work? We need to be clear on the morality of capitalism. And we need to be clear on the conditions under which capitalism can exist. Okay, so those are the four points I want to talk to you uh, this morning about. So what is capitalism? One of the biggest problems we have, I think, when we go out there and, and, and try to convince people that capitalism is a good thing and that they should be pro-capitalism, and this is a huge attack on capitalism going on right now, and that the Obama administration is just destroying capitalism, is that nobody out there knows what the hell capitalism is. No. They don't. You know, and, and you know, our friends on the right our so-called friends on the right don't have a clue what capitalism is or they're afraid to say it. I just read a book um, called The Battle. It's by Arthur Brooks. It, it's quite an influential book. It's doing very well in sales. Uh, it, you know, the blurbs on the back are from people like uh, Dick Cheney who calls it the playbook for the resurgence of free enterprise movement. Uh, Newt Gingrich, Bill Bennett, and so on. So this is like the conservative playbook now. Um, and it, it, it's kind of interesting because he talks about capitalism and then, and then he says, uh, you know, I prefer not to use the term capitalism and, and why not? And if you notice how conservatives talk, they don't talk about capitalism, they talk about free enterprise. You know, and he tells us exactly why. Because they did some polling. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out that 60% of Americans have a favorable attitude towards the term capitalism. 70% of Americans have a favorable attitude towards the term free markets. So free markets better than capitalism because it's polls better. But the word that polls the best is free enterprise. That polls 80%, right? 80% favorable rating. So they use free enterprise because it polls well. So then what does free enterprise mean? So, so here's the definition. And I give him credit for at least offering a definition, or, or claiming to offer a definition, put it that way. Uh, so he says, let's start by defining it. He says, free enterprise is a system of values and laws that respects private property, it's okay, encourages industry, celebrates liberty, limits government, and creates individual opportunity. What does that mean? So it respects private property. That's the, I guess that's a good thing. What does respect exactly mean in this context? It encourages industry. Whose industry? Which industry? How much industry? What does encourage mean? How does the government encourage industry? Um, celebrates liberty. So like yesterday on the 4th of July. <laughs> <laughs> Limits government by what standard? What is the standard for limiting government? and creates individual opportunity. Okay. So, they don't know, or if they know, they don't want to say what capitalism really means, what freedom really means, what liberty really means. And we need to be clear when we're talking about capitalism what we mean. Because the culture out there believes that, for example, capitalism caused this financial crisis. And we need to be clear what we mean when we say capitalism. Now, when I talk about capitalism, I say capitalism means freedom. It means real free markets. And what are free markets? Free from what? Free from government regulations, government controls, government intervention, government incentives, government encouragement, encouraging industry, right? It means, it means a separation of state from economics. Capitalism means, and, and that means that the government is not pro-capitalist, it's not pro-Friedman, uh, it's not pro-Von Mises, it's not pro-Keynes, it's not pro any of those economists. It's just not in the business of economics. Right? Government leaves us alone. So the government doesn't have a position vis-a-vis -vis economics anymore than it has a position vis-a-vis -vis religion or non-religion. 
It just has no position vis-a-vis religion, separation of church and state, separation of economics and state. That's what we mean by capitalism. Now I'll go back to the official definition of capitalism at the, uh, towards the end of the talk. But we need to concretize it. We need to explain it, right? It means no redistribution of wealth, not some redistribution of wealth as author books would like. It means no public education, not equality of opportunity, and therefore you have to have education, whatever the hell that means. What, you know, what does equality of opportunity even mean? But that's what Arthur Books advocates for. It means no government involvement in the economy. And we take that seriously. And we're willing to go out there and say, we're willing to go out there and say, there should be no Federal Reserve. Now, many so-called advocates of free markets get really, you know, how, how can you say that? That's too provocative or that's too difficult. But you, somebody has to say it. And we need to start defining what capitalism means. We need to start setting the terms of the debate. Because what happens today is the so-called pro-capitalists who don't define what capitalism or call it free enterprise, the free enterprise guys, are somewhere here in the middle. And it's a b- debate between the guys over here, right, a little bit right of center, to the guys over here a little bit left of center, and they're debating about the details. These guys still think we should redistribute some and redistribute and have a Federal Reserve and everything else. We need to define what's way out here. We need to define what's the principle of capitalism means, and what we can achieve by doing that is start moving the debate in our direction. We're not going to convince everybody, we're not going to convince everybody there shouldn't be a Fed. But we can introduce that into the discussion when people are talking about the Fed. We're not going to convince everybody that we should completely privatize all aspects of health care. But we can start moving people into a discussion about what it would mean to privatize aspects of health care. Because right now the discussion is just between, you know, a little tinkering here and a little tinkering there. We need to start redefining, and it's doable. It really is doable, and people find our position interesting, even in just these terms. You know, I remember being on, um, when I used to be on Fox Business on a regular basis, um, something came up about the Federal Reserve, and I said something like, there shouldn't be a Federal Reserve. And, and it took the hosts by, you know, and they didn't know how to deal with it exactly, and they kind of let it slide, and they left it. But then when I came back another time, I said it again, and this time a guy named Peter Schiff was on the television with me, and he said, yeah, there shouldn't be a Federal Reserve. And then we got into a whole discussion with the hosts about whether there should or shouldn't be a Federal Reserve. And then I started noticing those same hosts asking other people whether there should or shouldn't be a Federal Reserve. <laughs> and they even asked Alan Greenspan whether there should or shouldn't be a, a Federal Reserve. <laughs> And Alan said, well, you know, (laughs) between the Civil War and the establishment of the Federal Reserve in 1913, things were pretty good. That's it. And the, oh, and there wasn't a Federal Reserve during that period. And that's, that's how we left it. So never taking a position, but generally seeming to support it, right? Um, or, you know, I, I was uh, another time, I think it was Fox Business or CNBC, and, uh, and it was a show relatively early in the day, and we talked talking about health care, and I said, the real issue here is, is health care a right? And health care cannot be a right, and so on. And then for the whole, and we had a whole discussion around that, and other panelists chimed in, and then for the whole day, on that channel, they asked everybody when health care came up, whether they thought health care should be a right. You change the terms of the debate. And people start gravitating towards those ideas. They become ideas that are talked out there. They become ideas that are acceptable. Again, you're not turning them into objectivists. You're just moving the debate in our direction. You're making it more feasible for us to, in, to be in the debate, to be participants uh, in that debate. So we have to be clear about what we mean, and we have to be willing to be radical and commit to being radicals for capitalism, not moderates for capitalism not compromises for capitalism, appeases for capitalism, like most of our so-called friends on the right. Okay? So let's change the terms of the debate. Let's move people in that direction. But the next question you get, once you describe what you mean by capitalism, is, but we know it doesn't work. People know. They know. Americans know. 
Even those people who poll 60% favorable attitude towards capitalism, they don't mean capitalism the way we mean it. And when they think about capitalism, they think it doesn't work. And, you know, you get the standard questions when you, when you talk about capitalism. You get, you know, financial crisis. You get child labor in the 19th century. Right? You get pollution. You get a whole string of these. It, you know, it just doesn't work. And you have to be ready. You have to be ready for that. If you're going to be defenders of capitalism, you have to have answers to these things. One of the reasons it's really valuable to specialize. <laughs> You know, be really good in one thing, and you can say, I understand completely how free markets and capitalism work here. You know, and as they apply to, uh, you know, environmental issues, right? Pollution, clean water, so on. Or as they apply to healthcare, I really get that. And, but you have to know something about the rest as well, because you have to at least be able to guide them to the right place to read up. And it's crucial that we help people get educated about how capitalism does work and why all these objections are not real. You know, and a great starting place is Capitalism Not Knowing the Ideal, a book that is filled with great examples of this, not to mention, you know, one of the greatest essays ever written, uh, What is Capitalism?, which I recommend reading over and over and over again, because every time I read it, I discover new stuff there. It's a, it's a, true, uh, it's a true masterpiece. So we need to explain, we need to be able to explain that capitalism hasn't failed. And actually, that's relatively easy. It's relatively easy to explain that at least capitalism hasn't failed. Because once you've defined what capitalism is, it's pretty easy to say, whatever failed in this current financial crisis, and, and we can talk about all the different elements that failed, whatever failed, the one thing that couldn't have failed is capitalism. Because there was no capitalism. Because we've just defined what it is, right? No government involvement, no government intervention. And, you, you know, within three minutes you can show that there's just a little bit of government intervention in banking, just a smidgen, right? <laughs> Most regulated business out there, housing, mortgages, all of those, heavily, heavily regulated. So then you can argue about the details of, of how it failed. But at least you've established it wasn't capitalism. You've changed the terms of the debate. Was it bad behavior on Wall Street? Maybe. You know, I, I don't think so, not fundamentally. But you can talk about that. Was it Freddie Fannie, the Federal Reserve, all of that? Yes, I think it was. But you've changed the terms. It's clearly not capitalism. Now you're talking within a mixed economy. Okay, what are the elements that caused this to happen? And you've got to be ready with examples that, where capitalism has worked. You know, and the quick ones, easy ones, you know, East Germany versus West Germany, you know, when the Berlin Wall falls down. Hong Kong versus China versus anywhere. Right? Millions of people moving to a rock with no natural resources and nothing there. Why? Because they have freedom. Because there's the most capitalist country of its time, you know, or close to it. And no safety net. Actually, really, to, to a large extent, you know, no real Federal Reserve, not in the sense of, of the manipulations that, 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 that occur here. And here's a little rock where people thrive. And one of the things we need to be very careful on, and again, one of the things that I think differentiate us from our, the conservatives and libertarians and the others, is that what do we mean when we say capitalism works? We need to be careful not to be caught not to be trapped into a collectivistic trap. This is not about the size of GDP. This is not about econ just economic progress. So all of those are on our side as well. But what it really means is the ability of individuals to thrive. Are the conditions such that individuals are doing better? So if you take an East German and a West German and look at their lives, which one would you want to be? It's obvious, I think, to all, most Americans which one they would want to be, but it's about those individual lives. That's what, that's what capitalism boils down to. It's individual freedom, individual prosperity, individual happiness, individual success. That's what we need to focus on. The others just do, you know, utility maximizations, you know, whose, whose utility was greater, or, or you know, public, public goods, or, or you know, was society better off? And we need to stay away from that. That is 
you know, Ayn Rand talked enough about how wrong and how evil that whole perspective is of looking at these things in terms of collectives. We need to be careful not to fall into that trap. It's always about individual, you know, individual success, individual happiness, individual achievement. Where, where do individuals want to go? Do they want to go to Hong Kong in the 70s and 80s? Or do they want to go to communist China? Where are they going to be able to pursue their values? That's the sign of success. You know, the fact that immigrants come into this country, want to come into this country, millions and have for 200 years, 200 plus years, is a sign that people want to live here. Why? Ask, you know, Americans know why. <laughs> to some level, they understand why. It's about freedom. It's about opportunities. It's about the ability to pursue your values. Okay. So what is capitalism? We need to be clear on that. And then we need to be clear on that it works, that it works for you and you and you and you, that it works for each individual, even the people who claim to be opposed to it wouldn't switch with the East German. So we've established it works. One could argue that's been established by others over and over and over again over the decades, and we as objectivists know that the main argument against capitalism is not that it doesn't work, but that it's wrong, that it's immoral, that it's evil, that there's something wrong about it. And, but what's interesting when you talk to people is that they don't really hold it that way. Right? They don't, nobody actually comes out and says, I'm an altruist and, cap and altruism is incompatible with capitalism, so I'm against capitalism. Or, I like capitalism, but it really, you know, it's really inconsistent with my moral views, my ethical views, and therefore, you know, people don't talk like that, and they don't, unfortunately, <laughs> it would be cool if they thought like that. We, we would have a lot more influence, but they don't think like that. Right? So how is the fact that deep down we all know that they think capitalism is wrong, is immoral? They don't hold it like that. It's more that they have a sense of queasiness about going too far with capitalism. It's why, by the way, they're more, they, they, they pull better on free enterprise. Free enterprise is a lot less offensive than, than, than capitalism. Because capitalism, they have a sense, is, is really this, this real freedom. You know, where they're capitalists run out, you know, capitalists out there pursuing their own self-interest. We're all pursuing our own self-interest. So how do they hold it? I think they hold it in two forms, and you see it in the kind of questions you get. The one form is they hold it as, look, capitalism promotes self-interest. Capitalism promotes selfishness and greed. And selfishness and greed equals Bernie Madoff. So they hold it as, we don't want to be too far out here, even if it works, because we know something's wrong about selfishness. Something's not quite right about selfishness. And selfishness in them is this package deal that includes Bernie Madoff in it. It's about taking care of self and all that, but it's also Madoff. Right? So that's one way in which they hold it. So that's the negative view of selfishness. And the, the other way in which they hold it is the question you always get when you talk about these things. You always get it, right? Whenever you talk about capitalism and freedom and, you know, how it works and everything, somebody will raise their hand up and say, well, what about the poor? What about the poor? And that's how they hold it. They don't hold it at, wait a minute, this is incompatible with my self-sacrifice. I want to self-sacrifice today. And, because under capitalism, you can if you want. We don't actually stop you from doing that. Right? But they, they feel guilty, right? There's a guilt that comes up immediately. Wait a minute, if everybody's pursuing their own self-interest, if, if this system is, if there's no redistribution of wealth, if government is separated completely from the economy, then, you know, what about these people? <laughs> you know, what the, this group that needs our help, how do we take care of them? And their mind immediately goes to that. Okay? So we need to be able to address those two aspects. You know, what is selfishness and why Boney Madoff is not selfish? And what about the poor? So let's start with, uh, let's start with uh, uh, greed, selfishness, and, and packaging that package deal. And again, there's plenty of objectivist literature that explains this. And, and we, you, you guys all, I think, know what self-interest means and what selfishness means and why Boney Madoff cannot be selfish. 
And if explained right, people get it. Or people can get it, at least at some level. Again, and, and, and everything I'm giving you today is an outline, right? I mean, there's a lot, each one of these things, there's a lot to be thought about and chewed and written about each one of these aspects. But just in outline form, people kind of get, if explained, you know, so Bernie Madoff was selfish, right? He was self-interested. He pursued his own values, you know, his own happiness. That was his goal. Well, is Bernie Madoff happy? And, and, you know, was he? And, you know, and you can actually quote Bernie Madoff. It's a wonderful example because he actually tells you how miserable he was and how pathetic his life was and how he couldn't ever go to sleep at night. And it wasn't just about getting caught by the government. It was about being caught by his best friends and his family the people he interacted with every day that he was lying to every single day. And you ask people, you know, most Americans understand that if they spend their entire day lying to their best friends and their family, they're not going to be happy. They get that. You don't have to do big psychology tests to figure that out. That there's some relationship between being dishonest and unhappiness, particularly on that kind of scale. And then you can bring it down to a low scale and show them that you know, dishonesty just doesn't work, but you know, Bernie Madoff's not self-interested. And it's quite easy to show that he's self-destructive and that that kind of behavior is self-destructive. And then under capitalism, that kind of behavior is even more self-destructive than it is in a mixed economy. In a mixed economy, you might be able to, you know, lobby Congress to make your particular form of dishonesty legal. Right? You might be able to get away with it. Or you might just be able to get away with an SEC that is so busy with the thousands of minutia that they have to do, the, the thousands of little ways in which they violate our rights every single day, that they will miss the big Bernie Madoff. You could get away with it. In capitalism, you couldn't. Markets are much more efficient at getting crooks <laughs> under freedom than they are under statism. A lot fewer places to hide. So it's important to explain to them what self-interest is and why what motivates Wall Street is a good thing, is a positive, is a virtue. That self-interest is, you know, what we know it is. It's the rational pursuit of one's own values. It's about reason. It's about thinking. And that these people who negate, who evade, who ignore reality, who don't think, who don't use reason, are not what we talk about when we talk about selfishness, are not the products of capitalism. They're not the products of, of freedom. Okay. So we need to resurrect, and again, I encourage you all to read uh, the objectivist ethics and, and you know, what selfishness fully means. But we've got to get that word out there. We got to explain what self-interest really is in the defense of capitalism at whatever level that we can. And again, we're not going to get everybody there. We're not going to get everybody convinced. There's a whole philosophy here, right? But we can impact them. We can move them. At least don't associate capitalism with Bernie Madoff. The two are not. At least don't associate selfishness with Bernie Madoff. That would be a huge advance if we can just make that break. Okay. So defining self-interest, explaining, concretizing, giving them a sense of what self-interest really is. And then what about the poor? What do we do with the poor? Well. I mean, I think the point, the important point to make here is in what sense does somebody else's poverty place a claim on your life? Yes, the poor, okay. Why is that your problem? At least let them face them all code. At least force them to face their own guilt. Challenge it. Ask the question that they don't want to hear, which is why. Why? By what standard? Okay. And then, you know, because what do the conservatives say when you say, what about the poor? What's the first response that they have? And, and many libertarians do this as well. Charity. Charity will take care of all of it. That's not our answer. Yes, maybe it will, maybe it won't. But maybe it won't. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. And whose problem is that? Theirs. 
not mine, not yours. And we have to be willing to say that. We have to have the, you know, the backbone <laughs> to say. They don't have a claim on my life. And that means something. That means something. And yes, we think that charity will work and will take care of it. True. But that's not the essential. That's not the first line. You know, our first line has to be, it's my life. And they don't have a claim on my life. And I think an important claim to make, an important point to make, again, that comes out of our ethics that I think is somewhat unique, is that we're not doing the poor any favors by putting them on welfare. The people don't gain happiness. People are not successful when they become dependent on the state. Quite the contrary. They're worse off. That happiness, human happiness, human success, requires the pursuit and achievement of values. It requires self-esteem. Happiness just doesn't just come because you want to be happy. It doesn't come because somebody else hands you a check. Unless that check is earned. Unless you've achieved something. You've done something. And then you get the self-esteem that makes happiness possible. And the victims, the victims of the welfare state are the poor. I mean, we're all victims of the welfare state, but the poor are victims too. Maybe the worst victims. And Ayn Rand said the biggest victims of socialism and statism are the ambitious poor. They're the worst victims. I mean, you're born poor and you want to be successful and you want to rise up and the state just holds you down. Institutionalizes you into poverty. So the people you respect among the poor, those who are ambitious, thrive under capitalism. They thrive under freedom. The best thing you can do for them is free them up. Is bring about this capitalism that we're talking about. Okay. So, you know, take that issue away from them. Make them, force them to confront their altruism. And then challenge their altruism in the best way I think possible, which is why. And yes, they'll have religious explanation and everything, but there's something that works in our favor on this issue. There's something that works in our favor that underlies, I think, and, and this, is, this is uniquely American, because I don't think this works anywhere else. Americans have a fundamental sense of individualism. There's something in the culture, and this is what Ayn Rand called the American sense of life. There's a sense in which they get it at an emotional level, and, and you're seeing that a little bit in the, in the American response to what's going on with Obama right now. There's a certain sense in which they want to be left alone. There's a certain sense in which they want to pursue their own happiness. After all, they have a founding document. And this is, to me, the origin of the American sense of life. They have a founding document that says that they have an inalienable right not to maximize social utility or to, to benefit the public good or to, like they do in a sense in Europe, you know, they're founding documents all about the public good and, and social utility. We have a founding document that's about the inalienable right to your own life, your own liberty. And in the most selfish political statement in human history, every one of us has an inalienable right to our own happiness. That's still out there. That sense that they have, you know, that they want to pursue their happiness, that they want to pursue values, that they want to pursue their own success, that it's about me, <laughs> it's about them, it's about each individual, is still out there, and we have to latch on to that. And in, in my view, that's what these polls are picking up. When 60% they have a general positive sense of capitalism, or 80% say they have a general positive sense, what that picks up is that sense of life. And if that sense of life still exists among 60 to 80% of Americans, we have a shot. And we need a leverage on that. And we need to play into that. That's our opening. The founding fathers are our opening. Americans still love the founding fathers. And the founding fathers are on our side. Right? So let's use it. Let's use that. Okay. So... It's small. 
Capitalism is good. Again, just an outline. There's a lot more to be said on how you make that argument. But you've got to address the package deal of selfishness and you've got to address the issue of altruism as expressed by them. And you've got to hook into that American sense of life. And again, moving the debate. We're not turning anybody into an objectivist yet. Right? And what are the conditions then? What are the conditions that, that political conditions, moral conditions, that make possible in a society freedom, capitalism? What are the ideas that we need to have prevalent in the culture and certainly respected in politics for capitalism to be, to be possible? And this is where, and again, this is where we hook up to the, to the founding of this country. This is the key concept here is the idea of individual rights and what they mean. And again, moving the debate away from the discussion. And notice, by the way, that conservatives never use the term individual rights. They never use it. These are the people who supposedly, you know, the founding fathers are, are, um, are theirs, right? They own the founding fathers, the conservatives tell us. And they never talk about individual rights. Because they don't want to. <laughs> they don't understand what they are. They don't know where they come from. They don't understand what they are. And they would rather just, you know, and they would rather just let them go. I actually met with a, a couple of congressmen and we talked about the importance, I talked about it, the importance of individual rights. And their response, these are two Republican congressmen who claim to be free market guys and huge fans of Atlas Shrugged. And the response was, no, no, the left has already won that debate. You know, individual rights, then you have a right to health care. You, we don't want to talk about rights because there's a right to health care and a right to food and a right to this and a right to that. And, well, no wonder you don't want to talk about it. <laughs> if you believe, if you accept that. We need to get that concept back from the perversions it's undergone by the left and the right, by the idea that there is such a thing or there can be such a thing as a right to health care. Yeah. And again, people at some level get it when you say, well, if somebody has a right to health care, then that means the doctor has to provide him with health care. What does that make the doctor? Well, his servant, his slave, what about the rights of the doctor? Something, and people get that there's something wrong there. But it needs to be defined. You know, it needs to be defined in terms of freedom, rights of freedoms. They're not things that you get. We need to define what they are. We need to talk about individual rights in their proper meaning, in their proper sense, and bring the debate back to that. Healthcare is not a right. You don't have a right to a home. You don't have a right to a low mortgage. You don't have a right. None of those things are rights. Bonnie Frank would like them. Bonnie Frank would like them to be rights. And he's winning the debate. He's winning the debate because his opposition doesn't want to talk about rights anymore. We need to talk about rights. You know, we need to talk about rights in a sense of what they really mean. And of course, Capitalism is, you know, the social system that recognizes individual rights, right? Individual property rights in a way all private property, all property is privately owned. So that's crucial to our definition of capitalism. So if we go back to the beginning in terms of what is capitalism, well, capitalism is that social system. And social system is, you know, the legal, political, moral norms, laws, accepted views in the culture. That's the social system, right? That recognizes individual rights. It's all about these freedoms. That's what capitalism is about. It's about leaving us free to pursue our life, to pursue liberty, to pursue happiness. Okay? And again, there is a real link here with the spirit of Americans with the, with the sense of life. Yeah. So we need a political system, a political system focused on individual rights, and we need to talk about it because nobody else will. I mean, truly, objectivists are it when it comes to individual rights. Yeah. And you, we need to take it. We need to take it to wherever we can in the debate, in the discussion. It's the key concept that, is, that can help save this country. It's the key idea 
that can help save this country and move us towards more capitalism or more freedom so that we can buy time so that we can actually sustain a real intellectual philosophical revolution to the point where you know objectivism is the dominant philosophy and then capitalism will just happen right? true capitalism as we would like to see it right? so we need to work on establishing what those political principles really look like. You know, and again, concretize individual rights. There are plenty of examples out there of what is and what isn't, what's right and what's wrong. Okay? And then where do individual rights come from? Well, I mean, we can hook it up to self-interest that we just talked about. Right? We can hook it up to the requirements of human survival, of human existence, of what it takes for human beings to be successful, to pursue values, to achieve happiness. What do they need for that? Well, they need to exercise their mind. They need reason. They need to be rational. They need to have the freedom to do that. And what is the one thing? What is the one thing that can restrict their ability to pursue their values, to pursue their happiness, to pursue their goals, to use reason, to be rational? Well, it's force. And force is a destroyer of reason. Therefore, force is a destroyer of human life. And therefore, force is what we need to extract. So individual rights recognize two things. They recognize the idea that you are sovereign over your own life, that you, in a sense, own your life. It's yours. It's nobody else's. It's the anti-collectivist principle, right? And it recognizes that force needs to be extracted, that what it means for you to own your own life means that other people can't come and take it. They can't come and force you to do things you don't want to do. And that force needs to be extracted. Now, again, force is a difficult concept for people out there to get. They don't get it quite. Right? They get that stealing is bad. Pickpocketing is bad. Murder is wrong. Right? But taxes, that's okay. Right? <laughs> now, I like to use this, this small example. With, I, I've used it several times. Some of you have probably heard it with health care. It kind of tries to concretize force for them. Okay? So, and it tries to con concretize this whole debate about healthcare. And I say, look, if your neighbor's sick and doesn't have what it takes to get cured, so there's an operation, it's too expensive, he doesn't have the money to do the operation. He only has, in reality, he only has two options. He can come and ask you for your help, and you can either help him or not. Or he can come and steal your money from you and get the operation. But that's it. Now, if he hires the mafia to steal the money from you, is that any different? Well, no, everybody gets that, right? But if he gets the neighbors together and 51% of the neighbors say they should steal your money, then it's okay? How did it suddenly become okay because 51% of the people voted? And people get that there's something wrong here. They don't get it fully, but they get that they, you know, and the transition is pretty smooth, right? <laughs> you went from theft, mafia, that's still theft. Now the mafia's grown to the whole neighborhood and it makes it okay. And if we don't do the neighborhood, we do the whole nation, and 51% of the whole nation wants to take your money to give it to him. That's what taxes are, that's what redistributional wealth is, that's what the whole healthcare debate is about. Just in simple, concrete terms, in a way that most Americans at least causes them to stop and think. It's not convincing, it's not all the argument, it's not enough, but it causes them to stop and think about what's going on. That's the kind of moments we need. That's the kind of impact we need to have. You know, then send them to read Atlas Shrugged. That's great. But we got to get in. We got to find these entry points. Right? Okay, so we know what capitalism is. We've def we're going to define it. We're going to fight for that definition. You know, the system of, really, individual rights. Right? And that's the, that's the kind of culture we need to establish. We know that it works. I think most of us know intuitively that it works. I'm here to encourage you to 
get a full understanding of the, or not, you know, at least in one area, get an understanding of that it really works. And, and, and again, maybe very important is that what we had was in capitalism, so it, it hasn't failed. And, and you know, one of, the, one, of the, one of the questions I always get is, uh, and I find this fascinating that people come up with these things, they say, well, has it ever existed? And you go, no, right, because it never has existed. And they say, well, <laughs> as if they've won the argument, right? You know, and I, my response to that, and I'm sure each one of you would have a different response, my response was, did the United States, as the Founding Fathers conceived it, exist before it existed? Before 1776, was a country that respected individual rights that was free? No, there wasn't. And yet, here it is. It was created. So the fact that something never existed doesn't mean it can't, shouldn't, won't exist. But people somehow have this idea that they need a concrete, they need the concrete reality. You know, and I, I, I used to, the most frustrating thing when I, was, when I was a teacher was that I didn't have this parallel universe over here where everything was purely capitalist and I could show them what happens. <laughs> Although you, you have a feeling even if you showed them what happens, they wouldn't get it, right? Because it's not enough. It's not enough. Right? Because Hong Kong existed, America in the 19th century existed. You've got so many examples that are so close that you'd think the mind could extrapolate just a little bit to get it. But they won't because they're ultimately guided by their ideas, by their philosophy, by their morality. And that's, again, we have to challenge their morality and we have to explain why capitalism is a moral system, why it is the only system that allows us to pursue our happiness and therefore is the only system that is moral. So, we live in, a, um, in difficult times, very difficult times, I think. And the future, without objectivism, is quite bleak. Um, and, and, you know, macroeconomic predictions, any kind of predictions about the future are, are very much, I think, a, a fool's game, but hasn't never stopped me from doing it anyway. Um, it's difficult. It's really hard. Uh, a lot of factors go into it. Uh, you can tell general trends, but it's really hard to put a time frame on things. Um, I'm sure that in, if you lived in the 70s uh, in, in America, things looked really, really, really bad. And you couldn't imagine the 80s and 90s would ever happen, you know, in terms of economic growth and in terms of technology and in terms of, of, of possibilities of, of individual success. In spite of all that, I still think that we are facing a pretty bleak future in this country. And you just run the numbers, and I just don't see. I don't, maybe, maybe there's a way out. But I just don't see how you get out of those numbers. You know, and, and you know, this country is basically bankrupt. We just don't report the numbers right so that we could see it. Because right? the, the federal government has a balance sheet that if any corporation had that balance sheet, they would go to jail. Right? Uh, they don't report their unfunded liabilities. They don't report what, they, what they've promised to pay in the future. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, health care, a gazillion different things. And those are well in excess of $100 trillion. $100 trillion. Okay. And that doesn't include the ongoing deficits that we're running today. That's just Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. It doesn't include Obamacare, the coming socialized medicine, and everything else. Okay. You could tax everybody. At 80%, you're not going to get to that number. There's just no way out of it. Uh, there is no, we've reached a level of, of, of regulations and we're reaching a level of regulations here where the incentive to actually start a business and, and, and work and, and produce and increase productivity, which is what saved us in the 80s and 90s. We deregulated a little bit and there was this huge boom of productivity. We're going in the exact opposite direction right now. We're crushing productivity. We're crushing innovation. We're crushing venture capital markets and techn you know, technology markets are still relatively unregulated, but the guys who give them capital have just seen their taxes double. Double. Just last week when the House voted on this financial bill. What incentive now is there to be in that business? To make possible the huge technology advancements that are still relatively free. Although it's questionable how free they are when the largest venture capital fund in the world today is the energy department. Right? So the government's in this business crowding out the real venture capitalists. And you see all these economic numbers and it just is bleak. <laughs> it, you know, it, it, I don't see an obvious way out and the Republicans can win in November and what are they going to do? You know, 
What solutions have we seen from them that will actually not just slow this down, but actually turn it around? They might slow it down. They probably will slow it down. I mean, that's my hope at least. And maybe on some issues they'll turn it around a little bit. But what about these long-term structural problems that this country faces from a purely economic perspective? Not to talk about the cultural deterioration and the schools and, you know, and, and people can't read and the tension plan spans are zero and all of that. But that all plays into ultimately kind of an economic phenomena where we can't achieve our values. We can't become more prosperous. So we're facing, we're facing a real threat. Now, I, I, some of you have heard this analogy, but I like it, so I, I keep using it. If you've heard it before, that's fine. It's like we're on a raft, on a river, heading towards a waterfall. Right? And there are 300 million people on this raft, and all 300 million people have little row, uh, oars, and they're all rowing towards the waterfall. <laughs> and maybe you could argue the Democrats have big oars, so when they row, it has more impact. <laughs> And the Republicans have holes in their oars, so when they row, it has less of an impact. But that's questionable. <laughs> but everybody is rowing in the direction of the waterfall, and the waterfall is out there. It's always been out there. I mean, Ayn Rand knew it was out there when she wrote Atlas Shrugged. She knew we were heading there, and when that waterfall happens, we keep, one thing I'm sure of, we keep getting closer to it. Now, I happen to think it's 20 years, 25 years, something like that. Maybe that's because that's the length of my career still in the future, maybe. <laughs> I hope, you know. Uh, but that's the sense I have just from the numbers as, an, as a finance guy, I guess. Come on. That's what it seems to me. So we've got a finite time because once the waterfall hits, we don't want to be there. It's going to be hard to climb up that waterfall. You, we need to turn it around before we hit the waterfall and start going in another direction. And it's hard because we'll still have the current of the river. Ideally, you'd shift the current in the other direction. Metaphysically impossible, but with objectivism, anything is possible, right? <laughs> I mean, ideally, you have a motor at the end of that raft that pushes you upstream, and that's objectivism. But it's going to take a while before we get that motor in place and running. And in the meantime, we need to slow it down and turn this thing around slowly. And there's not a lot of time. And we need to get moving. And we need to get active. And we need to speak out. And we need to go out there and fight. This is a battle. I mean, it's actually not a battle. I mean, this is, this is a bad title. He, he, he uses the title battle. This is war. This is world war. This is world war. And the stakes are the stakes of a world war. The stakes of the future of Western civilization. You know, yes, subjectivism will rise up again, but who cares a thousand years from now? I don't. The stakes are our lives, our children's lives, our grandchildren's lives. The stakes are everything that we love about the world that we have around us. And we are the only ones who can fight this battle. <laughs> we really are. Read these guys, our so-called allies. Go listen to them speak the conservatives and libertarians, they're not going to win this for us. They can help on certain issues. They can help here and there. They, can, they, they write great economics papers, but nobody can integrate it. Nobody can pull it together. Nobody can present the case for freedom like we can. And if we don't, nobody will. And it's great that Alice Shrugged is being read by millions of people. That's not enough. If it was, we'd have won by now. We need to concretize Atlas Shrugged in the world today. We need to bring it to people in the world today. We need to bring these ideas every day, all the time, everywhere. And you need to do it. All of us need to do it. The alternative is horrific. And the primary way to do it is by living the best life that you can live, by being successful, by being happy to the extent that you can in the world that we live in, by pursuing your values. That is the most important thing. Nothing can replace that. But beyond that, it's time to stand up and go fight. It really is. Because I don't know if we get a second chance. Yesterday was, uh, you know, Independence Day, 4th of July. And, of course, it's the 224th anniversary um, when the Founding Fathers signed the Declaration of Independence. And they gave their life honor, possessions. 
They put them at stake. They put them forward. They put everything on the line to battle what was then the mightiest military force known to mankind. The probability of success, if you were looking at it as an alien from outer space, would very close to zero. And our chance of success, I mean, the fact is, is very low that we can actually succeed in the next 25 years. It's not huge. I don't know that it's worse than the founding fathers. They were willing to put it all on the line. I'm willing to put it all on the line. I hope you are too. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that the ambitious poor are held down by the welfare state. Can you give some examples of how that's the case? Yeah, I mean, it's at a lot of different levels. So uh, I think it starts, uh, you know, when they're very young and, uh, and the fact that their parents are receiving welfare and the kind of environment that kind of creates, the, the lack of ambition, the, 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 the culture around them which is just accepting of their position. And, and it almost becomes metaphysical. And they battle as, as children and teenagers to come out of that is it, so much tougher. But it, but it continues with, with the fact that if, you, if you're a young entrepreneur and you want to start a business, it's becoming more and more difficult. <laughs> And, uh, and it, you know, and you're expected, particularly if you're a minority, you're expected to go for minority loans. Now, that already already puts you into a box and against a, a form of welfare and a form of privilege that, that I think eats away at your self-esteem. And this is the most important aspect of, of redistribution. It eats away at their self-esteem. They can't really gain self-esteem when they're not really gaining values and, and when the society around them telling them they shouldn't be gaining values because they deserve it because the color of their skin or because they're poor or whatever. But think of the massive regulations. Think of the fact that, that bankers right now, you know, you remember the old J.P. Morgan uh, stories about how J.P. Morgan used to give loans. It was based on the character of the person who stood, sat in front of him. If you are a banker today and you say, I'm going to give a loan based on the character of the person who sits in front of you, the regulator is going to put you to, out to pasture. There's no way you will stay a banker. You've got to show them the models. Prove to me. You know, the good models were Covia used, right? Right, John? <laughs> I mean, it, it has to be statistically proven that this was a good loan. You can't look at somebody who's ambitious, who's good, who's got a good idea, and just based on that, give a loan like J.P. Morgan did and like I think bankers used to do good bankers used to do, based on, based on who the person was. Today it has to be, you have to document everything. If they'll even let you give a loan. Right now they're not letting anybody get a loan. So there are a thousand little ways in which government regulations restrict and prohibit and make difficult the ability of, 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 of entrepreneurs and, and particularly, you know, think if you're a rich entrepreneur, right? You come from a rich family. You can probably get friends and family. I mean, I know a lot of people in Silicon Valley, when they first start their business, they get money from friends and family. But if you're a poor kid, you don't have any friends and family with money. So, and, and now your other avenues are blocked. So, again, a thousand ways in which, but the more free you are, the more opportunities you, the, the, the more free a society is, the more opportunities there are for everyone, certainly for, for, for that poor, ambitious person. Yeah. Uh, each of us has limited time and effort to promote capitalism. Uh, what would you suggest as to the kind of people we should engage or avoid and also, uh, what context we can most productively do this? Well, I think the people we should uh, primarily engage uh, are that, you know, <laughs> are the people Brooks polls as having a positive view generally of capitalism as an America. I, I really think it's very difficult to convince people who hate this country 
uh, and hate capitalism of, of the virtue. They have to have the American sense of life. So find people that have an American sense of life, that respect individualism as poorly understood as that concept is. As, as, as misconceived as their perception of individualism is, there has to be a spirit about them that wants you know, their life to be good, their life to be better. You know, there, there has to be something in them that is self-interested, even, again, if it's not fully expressed, if it's not fully understood, if it's not fully practiced. So, so find those people with that American sense of life. And, you know, I hope that it's still a majority of Americans. Um, but, you know, again, within your worlds, I'm sure you'll find... It, it, you know, the people you, you should avoid are the nihilists. And the nihilists on the right and the nihilists on the left. The people who just want to destroy, who hate values. Uh, much of the radical left is that way. But a lot of the libertarian, you know, radical, libertarian, uh, uh, you know, segment is that way. And, and a lot of the real, you know, the real evangelical right, I think, is that way. So you, you want to find those people who don't, those are groups to avoid. And find, I think, where the bulk of Americans are, uh, which is, still have that positive sense of life, still want to do the right thing, still believe in some, in values. And again, find them young if you can, because you've got better shot at them when they're young than not. Do you believe the tragedy of the commons is valid? If not, why? If so, how can a capitalist society protect against that without infringing on indi individual rights? Okay, so, so do I believe the tragedy of the commons is valid? I don't believe the commons is valid. So I don't believe there is such a thing under capitalism as the commons. I certainly think that when you create commons, which means property that's not owned by anybody, then you have a tragedy. <laughs> um, but when people don't own something, they don't take care of it. And, and the way to solve all the issues relating to pollution, the way to solve real pollution, the way to solve the real issues that are involved in man's environment that, that are really harmful to man's environment. And by the way, one of the, one of the things I try to do when talking about in the environment is always ask whose. Whose environment? And, and because man's environment has never, ever, ever been better than it is right now. Ever. And in terms of any, any way you want to measure it, almost. So, you know, in terms of the real problems that might affect man's environment, property rights are the solution properly defined property rights, the elimination of the commons, in a sense. And, and you can see that, I think, with the oil spill now. The solution to how to deal with damages and who owns what to whom is imagine there were real property rights there. Imagine those marshes belong to somebody. Imagine the fishing rights belong to somebody. And how you do that, I'm not sure. But imagine that we'd figured all that out. That is the solution to how, you how, how that redistribution happens, because BP is liable. Now it's a question of to whom and for how much. Right now, it's pressure group politics, right? And, but you need to define in a, in, a, in a properly defined property right world, I think those would be dealt with. So I think, that, I think we have to challenge the idea that they need to be commons. Hey, again, Ayn Rand's definition of capitalism, all property is privately owned. Yes. Individual rights is a very high-level concept. After decades of what can best be described as very poor education, educational methods, are you concerned that too few people have the intellectual capacity even to understand it? I mean, we talk in terms of evidence and try to convince people via logic, but for people who have been brought up under, you know, I, I believe this is so because I was taught it, because the person of authority said so, can that make a difference? Look, if, if, if that is truly the state of people, then what's the hope, right? If individual rights is too hard, then all the concepts that we have to deal with are too hard, and then we might as well give up. We have to make inroads where we can. I, I do think, you know, enough people are still able to think enough if explained to them properly that they get, again, elements of it. And again, I'm not saying that this particular battle, there's a big battle, but this particular battle in this big war is, is going to lead everybody to be an objectivist. But can we make people understand that healthcare is not a right? I think we can. 
I think we can. And I think if we concretize enough, if we walk them step by step, and again, personalize it. Everything you do in these examples, try to personalize it. Ask them how they think about it, what they feel about this or that. You know, whether it makes sense to them, what they would like, if they were a doctor, you know, how would this play out? And I think, again, some people you're not going to convince. Maybe most people. I, I hope I'm wrong. But, but we need to convince the ones that we can't convince. And hopefully, you know, again, and, and this is why the bigger battle is an educational battle, because we, we have to save our schools and we have to save our universities and we have to, we have to get people thinking again. And we're not going to get people to, you know, change philosophically fully until they actually can think better. And that's a much longer term battle. Yeah. I think, uh, I'm sorry, I think there's an exciting possible trend uh, heard on the O activist list in Colorado, there was a reading group with the Patriots group there, and they started reading various different things, including Capitalism Unleashed. And it seems like I might be able to get the New York Tea Party Patriots to do that too. And I'm just wondering, I felt like that book might be a, an easier and very good introduction, and then later we could do Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. So I'm wondering what you feel about that. You know, I have to admit I haven't read it yet, but, you know, if, if you think it's appropriate and it's at the right level, which, which I expect it is, yeah, I mean, use the tools that you have. And, and uh, you know, I think, I think if it covers those principles of individual rights and, and what is capitalism, and it, 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 then, yeah, any way you can get into these groups and, and get to larger and larger audiences, I encourage you to go out and do it. And I think that, uh, I, I think you know, I'm surprised nobody's asked me yet, but you know, I think generally the Tea Party movement is a, you know, it's not really a movement, but the Tea Party phenomenon, if you will, is a positive phenomenon. It's the American sense of life saying enough is enough. They don't know what they want, but they know what they're getting is not what they want, right? This is bad. This is too much. Where do we go from here? They have no clue. And, they, you know, they're, they're tempted by a Sarah Palin for some bizarre reason, which is, which is I think, really, really tragic and unfortunate. But they have that sense of life that we need to capitalize on. They have that, you know, spirit that we need to help guide. So I, I encourage you. I mean, I know there's some nutty um, uh, Tea Party groups, and I would stay away from them if they're dominated either, either by the, 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 the really, you know, religious uh, elements or if they're guided by conspiracy theories. Also, I'd stay away from them. But I think most of the groups are not. The ones I've encountered are not really dominated by those elements. They need our help. This is an opportunity. There's a moment in history, and I don't know how long it'll, uh, uh, where there's an opening, where people are thinking, where people are challenging, where they want to know what the limits of government are. They talk about small government and limited government, but limited by what? Small, how small? By what standard small? Let's give them answers. Let's go in there and talk to them about these things and, and give them some options. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a shot I think we have to take right now. To promote my new flower shop, I had one place print my business cards, another print my brochures, and a third, my signs. Now my roses aren't red, my violets aren't blue, my geraniums look dead, and I don't know what to do. Staples can help your business stand out with signs, banners, and brochures that are a true reflection of your company. And now at Staples, spend $50 or more on print and marketing services and get $5 off your next in-store purchase. Now my business is blossoming, and I'm spending less green. Exclusions apply, in-store only, and 623.18. My question is in the category of being able to answer questions of objections to capitalism. Uh, almost everyone says that there would have been a real disaster had the government not stepped in with all the bailouts and the stimulus and everything. What's the real answer? What, what, would, what the government should have done at that point? Well, I mean, I think the real answer is we don't know. Uh, it's complicated enough that we can say that if they weren't the bailouts and if the government hadn't stepped in with something, if the Fed hadn't done anything, I, you know, we don't know. And in a sense, the Fed at least had to do something, right? It's its job. It's, you know, we have a Fed. We don't want a Fed, but we have it. Once we have it, it's got to act. It can't just say, okay, now I'm not acting. I acted before. I screwed things up, and I'm, I'm going to pretend nothing happened. So it's got to do something. And I think generally the fact that a lowered interest rate was the right thing, whether it kept them this low for too long, I think yes. But again, there is no real right answer ultimately because the Fed shouldn't exist, and therefore anything it does is, is, is wrong. 
I have I think that the answer has to be that the government shouldn't have done all the bailouts and all the other interventions, putting aside the Fed. Um, yes, it would have been bad. It would have been really bad. There's no question it would have been bad. But we would have come out of it. And we would have come out of it, I think, in some sense, stronger. Because we would have burst the bubble of too big to fail expectations. We would have, in a sense, implicitly deregulated the economy, even without any act of Congress, just by the fact of the government sitting aside and not intervening, not doing top, not bailing out GM. They would have established a new you know, set of assumptions, a new, and, and that would have been healthy long term for the US economy. What we've done is a disaster long term. I mean, Wall Street is going to be more, you know, worse than it was in the past because of these new regulations, but also because of the assumption that they can do no wrong. Now, if you actually look at the financial crisis and you look at the time sequence, it could have been things done in the beginning or not done in the beginning that I think would have mitigated a lot of what ultimately happened. So I'll just give you a quick example. In March of 2008, yes, March of 2008, Bear Stearns basically went bankrupt and was bailed out. The Federal Reserve arranged a marriage, right? Arranged a takeover, but it was a bailout. The guys at Lehman, who were very similar in terms of their situation at Bear Stearns, looked at that and said, cool. <laughs> Don't worry, be happy, right? And you can read the transcripts of some of the conversations they were having there and, and what was going on in the head of the CEO. And basically, okay, life goes on, nothing happened. Imagine if Bear Stearns had been allowed to fail. And the market would have snapped out of it in March of 2008 and, and say, wait a minute, something's going on here. And the government's not stepping in to bail us out. Somebody, you know, the CEO of Lehman is no idiot. He would have had sat down and say, wait a minute, do I look like best turns? What's going on? If I'm going to fail, I don't want to fail. Can I do stuff in the meantime to fix myself? I think the whole evolution of what happened on Wall Street post that would have changed. And I don't know that Lehman would have gone bankrupt. Maybe it would have, but it would have been prepared. One of the things people take, Lehman went bankrupt and financial markets fell apart. And it, true, but why? To a large extent, because Lehman didn't believe it would ever go bankrupt. Till the last hour, they didn't believe they would go bankrupt. They thought the Fed would bail them out. So they never prepared for bankruptcy. And if anybody knows anything about bankruptcy, law and stuff, you, this is something you prepare for. You organize for the lawyer, you know, the, the, the court is set up and, you know, you start negotiating with your creditors and there's a process. That process never happened at Lehman. They just went bankrupt and everybody, whoa. And then, of course, the next day AIG is bailed out and everybody said, we don't know what's going on here. We have no clue what the government's doing. So the biggest thing that the government did is create uncertainty. And the one thing, again, as a finance guy, I can tell you that finance guys don't like is uncertainty. We see uncertainty, we panic. We, go, we, we, we sell everything and we, we, we go into cash. And that's what happened. And who created that uncertainty? The government did, not the markets. Bernanke, as late as, as, as early summer of 2008, was saying everything's fine. No problems. Paulson was doing the same thing. And then two months later, the world is going to end. Unless you give me $700 billion and I can do whatever I want with it. That was the condition for top, right? How could they miss it so big? Well, the market assumed that something horrific. I mean, nobody could have handled this crisis worse. I cannot imagine a group of people handling this crisis worse than Bernanke and Paulson did. I really cannot. And they are heroes today. Bernanke got reappointed and Paulson's writing books and making millions. But they could not. If you actually look at the transcripts of what they said during that six months, Nobody is, you know, it, it just, I mean, maybe Hoover during the Great Depression did it worse, but it's very close in terms of, of and, and, and nobody points this out. Nobody talks about it. Wall Street and, and most of us in finance respond to a large extent to what these guys do because they have so much impact on the world of finance. And when they have no clue, are completely clueless and panicking and giving mixed signals, Surprise, surprise, financial market locked up. You know, that was a natural response. So I believe that this could have been handled a thousand times better by somebody who understood markets. But of course, we never could have, would have got into this mess if people understood markets uh, were at the top. These people had no clue. And they are, the real, they are real villains. Bernanke and Paulson are real villains. These are not just neutral guys. And Bush, of course, to save capitalism, had to destroy it. He said, those are his words, right? He had to fight 
fight against capitalism in order to save it. Um, and it takes a, a huge amount of ignorance and, 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 you know, more than ignorance, but something more. I'm not sure exactly what uh, to, to say something like that. Yeah, sorry. That was very inspiring, your own, very good. Um, one thing that really hit at home was uh, when you talk about Europe, the difference between us and European. Um, uh, you know, it, it made me understand why I can't really discuss politics with my sister or any of my Italian friends. Uh, to them, it's completely foreign, the idea that a government is there to defend individual rights. Yeah. And uh, my fear here is that uh, it's almost becoming foreign to us when you talk to people, and it's like there is really an urgency to really remind them to, and of course, you know, the books uh, will teach the kids, but, but what can you, it seems like something has to be done really to remind the politician immediately about this, and I don't know what anything can be done. I, I think you're absolutely right. The difference between Americans and Europeans is Europeans accept collectivism implicitly. They accept the role of the state implicitly. They have no concept of individual rights and no concept of individualism. Qua culture, I mean, certainly individuals are different. But qua culture, there's just none of that is there. And therefore, they're they have no problem just, just being guided down this road, and it's no accident that the 20th century is full of totalitarian regimes in Europe, because they just went with it. You know, it was just, it was just another, you know, the, the continuation of their trend towards collectivism. Uh, and yes, Americans don't have that, but we're losing it, and I think that one of the real goals of Obama and the real goals of the Democrats uh, and the intellectual left, if you will, put aside Democrats, the intellectual left, is the Europe, you turn us into Europe. They admire Europe. They worship Europe. They think Europe is cool. They think everything good happens in Europe. And they want to turn us into Europe. And one of the ways to do that is to destroy the idea of individualism and to destroy the idea of individual rights. And again, we need to fight that. And again, we're the only ones that can't fight it. Because, I mean, they won't. They, uh, uh, the people on the right just won't. They won't deal in those terms. They, because the conservatives ultimately are not individualists, intellectually, ideologically. They think they're individualists. They like the notion of individualism. Emotionally, they might be individualists. But intellectually, they're not. Intellectually, they're, they're collectivists. It, they, they, the, the conservatives are more split than the liberals. The liberals are consistent. That's why everything drifts left. The conservatives are split between a sense of life that's individualistic and pro-freedom and an ideology that's anti-individual rights and freedom. And they, are, they combat that. But yes, it's urgent. I have no silver bullets, though. Yes. In terms, I'm, I've got a question about meta-activism, essentially. So in terms of helping other people, motivating them, informing them, motivating an objectivist to engage in more activism. How is it that, that those of us who are outside of ARI can do that more effectively? What tools are people lacking? What is it that people are not doing that they could be doing? How do we, how do we encourage people, everybody who stood up here today, to, to up their game to the next level so that we don't hit that 25-year mark and crash and burn? Well, you can start by scaring them. <laughs> Thank you. You've done that. It's true. That what are the consequences of not upping their game? You know, and I think that the dire. I think, you know, I think that these activities ultimately people have to see a value in the activity itself, not just in because the outcome is long term. The outcome is abstract and, and very. Um, the fact is very unlikely. It's it's pretty unlikely we'll win in the next 20, 25 years. Good positive probability, but it's less than fifty percent. So it's hard to fight like that. So they have to enjoy the process. And giving them tools to help them enjoy the process and giving them motivation to enjoy the process and giving them intellectual tools that make that process easier is crucial. So, um, you know, I know that you guys have, have organized uh, help editing stuff, and I think that's, that's great, uh, you know, where, where you help people because people find writing so difficult. Uh, I think, again, getting involved in things like I think a lot of people find it cool to go to Tea Party demonstrations and put up signs of Alice Shrugged. It's relatively easy. It's, it can be fun. The responses you get are actually really positive. All the people who've read Alice Shrugged and tell you. I mean, find ways that, that you can enjoy. And, and challenge. The other thing is to, 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 to encourage people to challenge themselves. Go into something a little new. And, you know, I don't know. Uh, Learning new stuff is a value, I think, in objectivism, right? Expanding one's mind, uh, reading about new things, new knowledge. This is an opportunity to do that, right? There's a, there's a, a new area, I don't know. Um, 
you know, I think, I think we've got people doing healthcare, we've got people doing global warming, financial regulation. <laughs> I think it's interesting stuff to read about the financial history of America, what's involved, what's going on. You know, learn a new field. Uh, and, and, and become an expert, and at, least, at least somewhat. So find ways in which it, it, it personal, it, it, there are personal values to be achieved in the process, that it's not just fighting for some abstract future, but it becomes personalized. And, and, it, and it, you know, I, I'm not kidding about the scary part, because I think that is, that is a motivator. You know, things are bad, and I think we need to recognize that they're bad, and we need to recognize the intellectual environment within. And one of the things that I think is really crucial is to understand that our allies are so weak that they really need our help. You know, and, and that we have an opportunity to help people who are... You know, and the other thing is that we've got to have a benevolent, kind of a benevolent attitude towards other Americans who are not objectivists. If you start out by resenting them and thinking that they're just too, you know, they're just too stupid to get it or uneducated or, or, or um, immoral or just evil for holding the ideas that they have, you're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to be motivated. You're not, you, you, you got to have a certain belief, which I have, that, that Many of the people, most of the people out there, are, are in some fundamental sense, are good people, and that you can reach them. There's a level, at, again, a level at which you can reach them. And you have to be satisfied, and this is a challenge, but you have to be satisfied with not turning everyone into an objectivist. You're not going to, ever. Even in objectivist paradise, it ain't happening. Not everybody will get every aspect of objectivism. What we need to do is make them better. Make them better human beings. They will benefit from it. You will benefit from it. They don't have to be perfect, but make them better. And do it in a friendly, benevolent way. Because if you do it in an unfriendly way, you're not going to be successful. And they deserve better. I mean, they're not bad people. So, you know, move them along that spectrum. Move them towards opposition. That is a hu that's a huge thing. You don't have to make them objectivists. And I know we all want to go in there and give them the metaphysics and give them the epistemology <laughs> and slam their religion. And s it's not going to work. We're not going to get anywhere if we do that. You know, yes, there is an educational process in which we need to teach them about the metaphysics and epistemology and, and, and you know, get them to see that religion is silly at best and evil it was, but you know, that it just, it's just wrong. But, but there's a process. But we can achieve things before we get to that process. We can still move them in, in, in our direction. And, and I think that is important. The one thing that I do think we can crush, because I think it's so anti-American that Americans don't really, uh, are not really bought in completely. The two things that I think we can really crush are altruism and collectivism. Don't hold back. Those ideas are ideas that I think the American people are willing to let go of if we give them a legitimate alternative, which is rational self-interest. They don't have a legitimate alternative right now. Right? In their minds, they have altruism, which means being nice and giving to charity. And, and sacrifice is good, but their version of sacrifice is pretty interesting when you ask them what they consider a sacrifice and what they're really willing to do on a day-to-day -day basis. That's one thing they have. Another thing they have is Bernie Madoff. That's self-interest. Right? And they have no way to go with that. They're stuck. Give them, give them an alternative. And explain to them the full implication of their, of their, of, of their altruism, to whatever extent they have it. And then collectivism, I think, is, is even more foreign to Americans in many respects, although it's, it's rising in influence. I think that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. It seems like there's something important where people think that something isn't possible until it happens, and then that's taken as metaphysically given, as if it were always there. Like, you know, the constants of the universe or death and taxes used to be just death, now it's taxes too. Um, and, you know, the iPhone, like if you had described all these things that exist now, they, someone would say, what? what are you talking about? That's not possible. And today they view it as things that one can't live without and have always been here and will always continue to be here. Um, so I'm just curious if you could comment on that, like that trend, um, how that we can use it or not. 
Yeah, I don't know if it's a trend or not, but it's a phenomenon out there. It definitely is. And it goes back to this example I gave of we've never had capitalism, therefore it's impossible. You know? And, and it's, it's a sudden, very concrete bound mentality that has that. And you have to break it or you have to break away and from that. And give them lots of examples of lots of stuff that didn't exist before they were created and established and how good they are. And iPhone's a good example. Uh, you know, or, or cell phones. I, you know, it's not that long ago they just weren't cell phones. Right? You remember pay phones and using a dial, you know. But, but even in the realm of politics, there was never a United States before there was a United States. And there's something unique about the United States. You have to make that point. That wasn't before. Right? And, and, and nowhere. I mean, the founding fathers surveyed and they couldn't find anything that fit and they created something new. So something new can exist and work. Um, there was no, I, I like to point out to people, they were, this is Alan Greenspan's point, right? There was no Fed before 1914. And as far as I know, the e- economy of the U.S. from the Civil War to 1914 grew at the fastest rates in human history, right? For, at least for that period or for, until modern times, right? So it's workable. Show them examples of things that they believe are metaphysical didn't exist before, and it was fine. Things worked actually better in, in the case of the Fed than they do after. Okay. Um, I'm a product designer and uh, design engineer, and... Uh, um, I, I look at uh, the uh, level of technology in the 1960s, right, and and the the in comparison to sort of world technology, right. I mean, uh, we went to the moon, um, and we had one of the best car industries, and we had all these really great, awesome industries, right, and. Uh, from then to, you know, government motors, um, I, I, I don't see uh, that the uh, tech industry is almost any free, right? Uh, um, I, I see EPA regulations closing in, FCC sure. stuff, uh, nonsense like... Uh, um, Question. The, get to quite, because other people, we only have limited... Time. Okay, okay. Uh, um, I was wondering how how, you, how uh, people define uh, tech, right? Or how you define tech as as being eighty percent free or or, or yeah, uh, mostly free even. I, I, you know, you're right. I mean, it, the the government intervention in the t- tech industry is growing dramatically. I think the turning point was the Justice Department case against Microsoft. I think since then it's been downhill in terms of freedom uh, in technology. But when I look, when I, you know, when I go to Silicon Valley and talk to venture capitalists and talk to the kind of companies that they are starting, when I look at a lot of those, a lot of the companies here, yes, they have regulations. But, you know, if you, when, when you, um, you know, when you're in a bank in the United States and, and, and uh, when you hold a board meeting in the bank, you, you often are visited there by the, by the various regulators that regulate you. And any given bank can have five different regulators, some of them even more uh, th- than five different regulators, right? And, and, and they can come into your board meeting and they can dictate who can be a director and who can't. And they can fire a CEO. And I'm not talking about Obama kind of firing the CEO of GM. I'm talking about kind of legitimately, kind of so-called legitimately within the rule of law. The regulators have the power to tell you how to run your business, right? They're telling bankers right now, don't lend. They're not quite there yet with the tech industry, right? For the most part, tech board meetings don't have regulators in them. Yes, there's some EPA restrictions. Yes, you know, the the taxes are going up on venture capitalists. Yes, there's antitrust issues. But that's nowhere near. If you you know the scales of regulation, that's nowhere near the way in which financial institutions are being regulated. So I still think the tech industry, computers, software, so on, is mostly free. And, you know, if you want to tell me, no, it's 48% only free, fine. Uh, But it's much more free than the banking industry is. Much, much, much more. And banking probably went from 80 before the crisis to 95 government run today. So, you know, there's, there's very little room for freedom if you're a banker right now. Yeah. I'd like to underscore a couple of things you said. Uh, in the past year and a half, I've gotten, been enjoyed getting involved in local politics and uh, sat in on a meeting with the state uh, Republican chairman. We really have to be fast because I've got one okay. minute left. And uh, there were about 70 people there. We all got to speak our views. And I said, uh, we talk about reducing the size of government, but nobody's talking about what to dismantle and mentioned some things to dismantle. 
by the time the other half of the room had spoken, uh, two other people had picked up on that word dismantle as well. Look, we can change the terms of debate. I have no question about that. People have no ideas out there. There, there, there's a vacuum, there's an intellectual vacuum, other than in the radical, you know, the, 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 the nutty right and the nutty left. In the big middle, there is a vacuum of ideas. It's a mishmash. They pick up a little bit from here and a little bit from there. There's no cohesion. And when you come and with confidence present a principled position, people listen. People want to know more. And people start picking up on, on, on your ideas and you can really move the debate by doing so. It really is, you know, the world, it really is ultimately ours to win. So I encourage you all to get out there and start fighting. Thank you all. All material in this program is protected by copyright and may not be reproduced in any form or manner, nor played before a live audience, without the express written permission of the producer, the Ayn Rand Institute. For further information, or to order other products, please visit estore.aynrand.org or call 1-800-729-6149. To promote my new flower shop, I had one place print my business cards, another print my brochures, and a third, my signs. Now my roses aren't red, my violets aren't blue, my geraniums look dead, and I don't know what to do. Staples can help your business stand out with signs, banners, and brochures that are a true reflection of your company. And now at Staples, spend $50 or more on print and marketing services and get $5 off your next in-store purchase. Now my business is blossoming, and I'm spending less green. Exclusions apply, in-store only, and 623.18. 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62318 62